Well, welcome. Uh, this is the lesson for the 16th of uh, August, and we're uh, working our way through basically the Gospels, looking at uh, various events in the life of Jesus. Today we're going to be looking at uh, probably one of the best known of the great miracles uh, in the Bible, in, in the Gospels. Uh, the only one, incidentally, that is recorded in all four Gospels. Only this miracle that we're going to be looking at today was recorded in all four Gospels. Um, it is often said to be the, the most famous of all. Um, I, I kind of refer to Lazarus as probably maybe greater than this, but from the standpoint of how many people were affected and uh, the opportunity it gave Jesus to talk about being the bread of life, this does rank right up there with the very top, no doubt about it. Uh, so we're going to be looking today at the feeding of the 5,000. And let's jump right in. Um, Dougie, is your eyes good enough to read? Oh, yeah, they're All right, great for reading. good. Okay, you're probably better than I am then. So if you would, John, we're in John chapter 6, uh, verses 4 through 10. Please read those for us. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming towards him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people may eat? Now notice he asked him to test him, for he knew himself what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. Now one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? Now Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in the place, for, so they sat down. And the men numbered uh, about 5,000. This passage tells us that uh, this, the Passover is near, and uh, that would have been in the spring of the year. Uh, I think that's important because what we see here is a huge crowd that is gathered to hear Jesus. Uh, estimates are that with 5,000 men, there were very likely upwards of 20,000 total people because at that time women and children would not necessarily have been in the count, it would have been the men. So we're talking about a huge, huge crowd of people. Um, also because it's in the springtime, um, some researchers have said that uh, there would have been a large number of people like, like this around uh, the area of Galilee because this would have been a time for gathering in early crops and or planting crops for the, for the summer. Uh, so there would have been a lot of itinerant laborers, perhaps looking for work, uh, that would have been available to listen to Jesus as he's, as he's teaching and preaching. Um, the, the crowd had gathered around Jesus. Uh, apparently, we, hear from, we know from other Gospels that he had been teaching them all day long. So he had a long sermon, if you will. You think a 45-minute sermon here is bad? I mean, yeah. But of course, this was Jesus, so you know, it was, that's different. He can speak all day long and keep your attention. Um, but there was a huge crowd coming, and uh, they, they listened to Jesus all day long. And it got towards the evening, uh, towards dusk, and um, the other Gospels tell us that, uh, you know, they, Jesus even said at one point, well, let's you know, go get something to eat, farm to eat. What are you going to do with these people? How are, we gonna, how are they going to eat? Um, and he asks here, where will we buy bread so these people can ask? Now, notice he says this, and he asks this, of Philip. Now, why Philip? Well, partly because Philip was raised in Bethsaida, which would have been nearby. Uh, he knew the area. He would have known how far it was to go to town. As a matter of fact, Bethsaida probably from this point was probably somewhere like nine miles away. So it would have taken quite a while to, to walk that far and then to walk back if you could find enough. Um, where, where, you know, where would we buy bread? Well, Bethsaida is the biggest community far away. Uh, but notice that Jesus asked Philip this uh, to test him. He already knew what he was going to do. But now he's testing Philip and asking, what are we going to do, Philip? Philip doesn't appear very often in the Gospels. Uh, he just, he's just not one of those prime people like Peter and John and James and some others. Maybe Andrew here. Uh, Philip just isn't mentioned that often. So the fact that Jesus kind of sings him out of this particular case is kind of, kind of interesting, I think. Um, Philip responds, uh, well, you know, if we had 200 denarii, it wouldn't be enough for, e any, for each one to have just a little. Now, 200 denarii would have probably been a pretty good day's wage. Um, as a matter of fact, for some people, it would have been 
could be a week's wage or more. But, but I think the inf inference here is it's about a day's wage. So if you took a day's wage today and bought food with it, could you feed 20, 000, or 5,000 men and maybe 20,000 people? I, I doubt we could. Um, so all these are building up to the great miracle that Jesus is going to do here. Um, I'd like to yeah, part six please. where he said that uh, he, uh, he asked this to test them, for he himself knew what he was going to do before mm -hmm. he even asked the question. Mm -hmm. You know, there are those who, because James says uh, in chapter 1 that God tempts no one to sin, that that also means that God doesn't test anyone either. Mm -hmm. They kind of combine the two in confusion. Uh, there's a lot of difference between tempting because a temptation is to lead to sin, right. which is why the reference in James that God doesn't tempt anyone mm -hmm. uh, to lead them to sin, but he does test them. And one of the greatest examples that we've had of that is Genesis 22, where the Bible plainly said, says that God tested Abraham to see if he loved him more than he did his son Isaac. And so we have the whole story of him taking Isaac up on the hill and uh, laid out the wood and got everything ready. And Isaac said, well, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And he tells him God will provide. And, uh, it's a story ends with Abraham ready to kill his son. And Hebrews tells us that Abraham was going to do it because he thought God would raise him from the dead. And so that's why he was going to accomplish this task. But then we know God stopped him and said to him, uh, no, there's a ram who's got his horns caught in the thicket. But now I know, it says, that you do love me more than even this one. And... Uh, God is going to test us, and that's sometimes why our prayers are not instantly answered. You know, God wants to see, do we really desire the thing we're praying for? Uh, how much do we want to see that loved one be saved? How much you know, do we feel about a real need and these other things? So God is going to test us, but God will never tempt us uh, to fall into sin. Right. Good point. I think sometimes, I think when God tests us, it's not so much, it's to prove to ourselves that we want this, we desire this, or that this thing is more, impo more important to us than anything else. The test, we, are test, <clears throat> we have to prove to ourselves. It's to show us what's important in our life. Not to, to prove to God what's important, because oh. he already knows, but it's just, we have to see, look, it, it, he turns us to look inside of ourself. And I think that's the importance of the test, is that we get to see what we really are, what really manifests in ourselves. Amen. Let's move on to verse 8. Um, another of the disciples, this would have been Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The, Andrew is the one who led Simon Peter ultimately to, to Jesus. Um, comes up with a solution. No, not a solution, I should say, but rather he comes up with something and he knows it's not enough, but he says, now there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but he, but notice, but what are they for so many? In other words, now here's something, but it's not enough. Now, the barley loaves are not like loaves of bread today. We go to the store, we buy that, you know, long loaf of bread, and it's, you know, it's already sliced. And this would have been more like um, a pita or something like that, a round loaf, um, probably not real thick, um, I guess, that the bread that the Indians make would have been very really similar to this, huh? Non. Non, yeah, something like that. Um, and barley would have been the poorest grain that you had for that area. Uh, wheat would have been a better grain. Uh, uh, a lot of corn, if there's something, or maize or something like that, would have been a better grain. But, but really, barley loaves were fit mostly only for feeding animals. So the barley loaf was, was a very poor kind of bread. And it says two fish. Some uh, researchers I've, I've been reading have said that that may have been more like, a, almost like a pickled fish, something that you know would have been pickled and preserved, and then when it came time to eat, you know, this little boy had a little. He had a little lunch with him. Yeah. A couple of sardines. A couple of sardines. That's that's about what it was. Yeah. Uh, so let's not get the impression that you know these are huge amounts of food. It's a small amount of food. It would have been a little lunch. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to run out, you know, 10, 12 years old, I used to run out to the woods with my friends, and we'd take a little sack lunch, and, you know, you'd have a little something in there to eat, maybe a little sandwich or something. Uh, that's about what this kid had. Uh, 
we don't have any information that his mother or father are with him, so he may have just wandered out there on his own, you know, going, going exploring, seeing who this new guy is, going around telling people things, who he was. Now notice, in, uh, in verse 10, Jesus says, have the people sit down. Now we have a little expansion of that in, in uh, Luke chapter 9 and Mark chapter 6, where this is also recorded, um, because in those uh, Gospels, we find that uh, Jesus basically said, now set them down by the fifties and by the hundreds. In other words, it was very well organized. Uh, there have been times when the, when the Bible records that the crowds pressed around Jesus. Uh, but in this case, you can't have confusion. You can't have people just riding, if you will, and, and, and oh, there's food, let's get to the front and get some. So Jesus organizes it, um, gets, it gets everything where it should be, puts people together so you can count them and you know about what you need and also so that when the disciples start feeding they can actually feed the people in a very organized manner. So this wasn't like Portland? Uh, this is not like Portland <laughs> at all. No. <laughs> or Chicago and the Magnificent Mile. No, no. This is well organized. Before you go on, yeah. let me go back to verse 8. Sure. And when Andrew says, you know, there, there's this little boy who has uh, five barley loaves and two fish. Had he stopped there, he would have shown a great faith. That's right. You know, yeah. He, he says, Jesus says, well, what do we have? And he said, boy, this little boy's got five loaves and two fish, and Jesus, you can do anything. <laughs> and I know that you you can make, you know, yeah. just make it enough. But instead, we see his lack of faith when he adds, but what is this among so many? Yeah. And yeah. we're like that at times. Yeah. We, we tend to uh, look at what we have and think, you know, well, if I had more time, if I had more money, if I had more of this or had more of that, God could use it, but what is my, you know, little bit among so many? Right, right. You know, we need to, in faith, stop. You know, they, okay, there's five loaves and two fishes. Jesus, now let's see what you're going to do with it. Uh, we'd be better off if we would just stop there. Instead, though, we usually go and say, but what is this among so many? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The exactly. fact that he brought it up had showed some faith because he said at least this is a start. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can add to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't a complete lack of faith. He had some faith because he even mentioned it. That's right. Yeah, that's true. And I look at that totally different. I don't see that it was a, 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 an expression of faith. That he was. I think he was like doing an inventory. Like I would do an inventory of food. You know, here's what we got, or here's what I found. You know, and people are a matter of fact. The only kid that brought food was this one, and th th that type of thing is not necessarily. This is what we can what we can do with it. It's just here's the facts. We have one kid with five things. That's it. I bet you people showed up on Wednesday night, and all you had was five loaves and two fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that become no, well, we'd be we'd be asking for catering. We? <laughs> <laughs> Call the caterer. Yeah, they couldn't do that here. Yeah. that's right. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, uh, I think what we're saying here is make do with what we've got, and if we're operating individually and mutually with the bread of life the living water, then we can figure out how to feed many with a little. That's right, and, and this is not just what we do, but it's having faith that God can take what little we have and do something with it. Uh, yeah, I think that's... That is the premise of what I stated, you're right, yes, Randy. Yes, exactly. I think sometimes as Christians today, though, we get so locked into the materialism mm -hmm. of our culture, of our life, that we just fail to realize that even something small God can use and it sometimes isn't until we look back retrospectively we look back at it and we see oh I didn't that wasn't much at all but God really did quite a quite a business with it didn't he but that's for somebody as we look back not as we look forward unfortunately so he's got them sitting down in the field yep and doing uh, by fifties and hundreds and uh, that shows that, you know, we, we too uh, shouldn't do things halfway. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That, you know, a lot of times we just, uh, at the last minute, throw something together and think, you know, or what they used to say, throw it against the ball and see if it sticks. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. No, uh, this does point out that God, when he works, does not work in chaos. God does not work chaos. God works 
miracles, but he works them in a very organized and systematic fashion. He knows what he's going to do, and um, it's not chaos. It may look like chaos to some people on the outside. I'm sure if there were 20,000 people sitting on this grassy lawn. It had to be a pretty good, pretty good sized place, but if you had 20,000 people sitting there, um, it could get chaotic very quickly. But by organizing the way he did, um, he was able to get people fed in a very systematic way, probably pretty quickly, as a matter of fact, with 12 people handing down stuff. It's still a lot of people, but um, it could be done in a very systematic fashion. God does not work chaos in the church. The church is an organized structure. Uh, we have a worship service. We have an order of worship. Almost all churches do. Uh, churches that use a liturgy have a systematic way of going about the liturgy. And so we're not, we're not operating in chaos. Uh, we are operating with a systematic way of doing things. And that, I think, is is, a, is how God operates, in a very systematic way. He can bring order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. Yes, he can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's move on then quickly to uh, the next section, which is, again, John 6. Uh, we're going to look at 11 through 14. Doug, you want to read those for us? Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told the disciples, Collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled twelve baskets with pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, Truly this is the prophet who has come into the world. I notice that, uh, as a matter of fact, this week in the uh, Study to Grow lesson, I'm going to be referencing um, the miracles in John 7, miracles. And, and one of the things that as I studied those sometime back that I noticed was that Jesus was never overly demonstrable in things he did. Jesus didn't call attention to himself. He did miracles, but he did it in the most quiet and if you will, systematic and, and efficient way. Um, when he turned the water into wine, all he did was say, fill the jug, not take to the governor of the feast. When he healed the nobleman's son, he said, you know, you know, go your way, your son lives. Always, Jesus almost uh, understated when he did a miracle. And here we see the same thing, um, that he simply gave thanks. He gave thanks and then he distributed to his disciples. And I think this is one of the things that sometimes we fail to, to think about as Christians is we don't have to go around, you know, hitting people in the head with the Bible, you know, we call them the Bible thumpers. We don't have to go around with loud voices and, and drawing attention to ourselves and things. All we really need to do as Christians is simply live the life that God calls us to live the way Jesus told us to live it, using him as our example, our Lord, and do it in a quiet and efficient manner. We don't have to be demonstrable in things we do. I mean, people want big sermons and big speeches, and this is what politicians do. And as Christians, we don't need to do that. If the Holy Spirit is working, just a few words sometimes is all we need to have. The right words that the Holy Spirit will give us to... to um, Fellowship with another with another person, perhaps lead another person to God. Yeah, last week in CBC serves study to grow. Yeah, <laughs> mine was on, you know, that when you pray, don't put on a show. Right. When when you uh, are doing other things such as fasting, uh, all, all these things they're not to be a show. Right. You know, in fact, I quote a verse that says that we should make it our aim that we live our lives in such a way that we live a quiet life minding our own business, working with our own hands. Mm -hmm. And we're admonished by Paul twice in, in his uh, uh, epistles uh, to do this, that Christians are to live a quiet life. We're not to be living demonstrative lives which uh, put on a show. And like, draw attention to ourselves. That's right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Guys, I really, uh, I love what you're talking about here, and right on point. Uh, Jesus, at that point in time, Son of God, he knew who he was internally. He knew what he was up to internally. So he didn't have to be boisterous about it. He just did it, and the satisfaction came from within, knowing he was righteous in it. 
Well, I think that applies to us as believing men and women too, doesn't it? When we know who we are, when we know what we're up to really, and then we do it through the obedience, through the Holy Spirit's guidance, well, we don't have to have flamboyant recognition. The reward is that we knew what we did and why we did it. Very true. And one of the things we see here, I think, again, is uh, in kind of picking up on the thought from both Barry and, and Doug, um, he wasn't demonstrable, uh, but the result was that people had as much as they wanted. There was no, now let's throw no more than this much on a plate. You know, sometimes on Wednesday night dinners, we have to say, now, you know, we're going to kind of serve this because we want to make sure it goes around. Jesus did say just a little bit for each person so it goes around. One helping. One helping, yes, yeah, right. You know, uh, they had as much as they wanted as the disciples are serving. Look at uh, verse 11 here. Uh, as much as they wanted when they were full. These people ate as much as they wanted. Some of them, I'm sure, were pretty hungry. I don't know how much food was there, but I can tell you this, it was enough that everybody was, was satiated. They were full. They didn't need anything more. And when it was all done, Jesus says, now collect what's left over. We don't want to waste anything. I think that's informative too. Jesus, when and God, when he is doing works, he doesn't waste things. There's no waste there, you know. We have a tendency in our culture to throw away things, just throw them away. But God doesn't throw away things. God doesn't waste, uh, whether it's material possessions or whether it's the gospel. Nothing is wasted when God is, is dealing with it. And my mom would always tell us, eat your food because they're starving children in China. <laughs> oh, I've heard that before. Yeah. But yeah. she would never ship it over there for me. By the time they get there, wouldn't be <laughs> Uh, yeah, guys, that's what my father always said to me. God rest his soul. He's in heaven now. Can't wait to get back with him. But he'd say the same thing. He'd say, hey, look, I'll buy you a quality meal, but I want to see that plate clean because there's a lot of plates that don't have anything in it. That's right. Notice that when they did collect the, the leftovers, uh, kind of interesting, isn't it? That God has leftovers, too. we got a lot of leftovers in our refrigerator, but, you know, God collects the leftovers, and so nothing's wasted. And when they collected them, there were 12 basketfuls. Now, he started off with five barley loaves and two fish, and in the end, he's got 12 baskets of food. Kind of matches up with the 12 disciples, doesn't it? Kind of interesting, I think, 12 and 12. And then later on in Matthew 15, when they do the 4,000, yes. there are seven baskets taken up, which the reference there's probably only seven disciples there that day. That yeah, could be. That, that's a good point, yeah. Also, I found this interesting. Um, they collected and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves. Yeah, no fish. No fish. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> no fish. Now, I don't know why there's no fish, but you know, but I think Jesus is, I, I personally think, it's personally, it's Randy, that the barley loaves were collected because Jesus is going to use that as the example of a sign that he's a bread of life. Well, plus the fish may not have been been preservable. May not have been. Know, yes. If they were freshly cooked or whatever. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't last. Good point. They were pickled. The last they were round. pickled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they lasted just as long as they needed to, Tom. Maybe, maybe Randy was pickled when he said that. <laughs> <laughs> right here in the book. I no, might have been. Right. <laughs> hey, I, I don't know about you guys, but pickled herring, whew, that's hard to get down, so I would have been really hungry. <laughs> yeah. Hard to look at the jar. Yeah. Yeah. And it no. doesn't yeah. say how many people stuff stuff in their pockets. Either. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there are some people who... <laughs> the nine mile <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. Save this for later. Save Good it point. For later, yeah. Yeah, yep. There's still 12 baskets left. Yeah, that's right, still 12. Notice in verse 14 then, that, and notice this, now, John is the one gospel where he says that these miracles, the seven he recorded, were sign miracles. And a sign miracle means that there's not just the miracle itself that happened, but it's a signal that something greater lies behind the operation of that miracle. And notice he says here, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, truly is a prophet, this truly is a prophet who has come into the world. Um, in some ways then, I think, they missed the sign. They, they, they took the 
bread as a sign rather than taking the, you know, the, the sign from the bread, if you will. Um, they missed it. They missed the point. And so many people in Scripture miss the point. I'm sure today we miss the point as well. I think God does things in our lives and events happen in our lives and we have a tendency sometimes to, uh, to say, oh yeah, I, I see, that's really great, but we don't necessarily see what God is doing behind the scenes. We don't see it as a sign for us to draw a greater understanding from that miracle that, that God, or just a simple working in our lives that God is doing. Thus. I think you're right. Uh, what, what really stands out here, uh, because of what you're saying, the signs were to prove he's in the side. That's right. But what do they say in verse 14? Well, truly, this is the prophet. Yeah. yeah. See, they, they don't elevate him to the position of being the true Messiah. They just see him merely as one of the prophets. Right. Later on, G, uh, Jesus asks the disciples, who do men say that I am? Some said John the Baptist, some said Elijah, some say one of the prophets. And so here we have a you know, thing, but Jesus then asked them, well, who do you say that I am? Well, you're the Son of God, the Son of the living God. Uh, they elevated it to where it should have been by the people, but they missed the, the sign. And in doing so, they only thought he was one of the human beings who had lived in the past, rather than seeing him as being the Messiah who had come to take away the sins of the world. And keep in mind that they had not had a prophet, other than John the Baptist, had not had a prophet for 400 or so years. So there were people that were probably, you know, looking for a prophet. And Jesus was starting to fulfill some of their wishes and some of the things that they thought a prophet would do. But as, as Doug points out, I think rightly, uh, they did not understand this was the Son of God. This is this is the Messiah. So they, they missed the elevation. They elevated him just to the prophet level, but not to the Messiah level. They missed it. Uh, one of the things we see here also, just a final thought, uh, when we go back to the children wandering through the wilderness, remember that the manna was available for them every morning. It was a kind of sweet bread, we're, we're told. Um, but every morning they had manna, to meet their daily needs for sustenance, for food. And in some way, some ways, I think, G, that was a kind of a prototype of what Jesus was going to be. He, he, he declares himself to be the bread of life. There are also seven I am statements, incidentally, in John, and one of those is I am the bread of life. So, in a way, the manna, I think, is a prototype of Christ being the bread of life. That's right, just a final thought there. Along with that, we might add that God didn't allow any leftovers of that either. That's right. Because with the manna, if you didn't eat it, it would spoil right. overnight. Right. Or if you took, <coughs> you got some on the Sabbath day, it, it would ruin. Right. Or there wouldn't be any, or, you know, if you took too much. I can't right. remember right now. But there was no waste to be with the manna either. Right. right. Good point. Very good point. Any other thoughts or comments? Uh, the only thing I'm seeing, guys, as you're expressing this, is I, oh gee, pampered and how blessed we are as Americans. In our worst moment, we don't really have a sensitivity or a clue to the rest of the world in these categories of no bread, literal, no food, no water. Mm -hmm. It's beyond my capacity as an individual man to, to contemplate how to orchestrate it. But our dross our waste, just food. If we can figure out a way to really orchestrate it, get the politics out of it, I, there's no reason the world anywhere on it should be hungry meal. Good point. Now again, it's beyond, it's beyond me. I don't understand how to do it. But boy, you, gee, would I rally to... Uh, we do try. We do feed the poor. And, and all that's part of who we are as believing men and women. But we've just scratched the surface in the understanding that nothing went to waste. Right. Well, part of that is why our missionaries go over and they dig wells. And we have a uh, collection for hunger once a year in the, uh, October. And 100% of all that money... Uh, goes to help our missionaries and uh, to help with hunger around the world. So, you know, as Southern Baptists through our co-opter program, we are trying to meet uh, those needs, but for sure we're not meeting all of those needs. I think also if we look at the uh, the different places where we have food, you know, here in town we have the food pantry and the 
uh, with the Methodist Church. We all cooperate now. All the churches cooperate in that. In Pacific, we have the Agape House. We've taken some things down to the Agape House. And, uh, we have some food right now to take down, as a matter of fact. So, but you know, uh, m many of those are Christian-based. Now, they, they, they may not necessarily be, you know, attached to a church, but they're, they're Christian-based food pantries and things. And uh, here again, I think we see Christians reaching out, trying to help other people in, in a very, um, at, at the basic level of need for food and clothing and other things like that. Let's move on to uh, verses 26 and 27, and then we're going to jump down to 32 through 35. Uh, Doug, again, you want to read those for us, please? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you're looking for me now, because you saw, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and you were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for food that lasts for uh, eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set a seal of approval on him. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus said to him. No one comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. As we've already stated, they missed it. They missed what the important part of this miracle was. They ate the bread and they were filled. And for that moment, they were satisfied. But what Jesus, I think, is trying to point out here is there's more than just eating the bread. There's something more important even than that. And notice he says, um, you are looking for me, not because you saw the sign. They did not understand the sign that Jesus was trying to point them to, which was his messianic nature. But he says, because, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. They were physically filled, but spiritually they were they were not understanding. They didn't see what Jesus, who Jesus really was, and what he was doing. He goes on By to say, way, Randy, that is so strong, you know. As you're sharing that, brother, I, I, I remember the verses that say, "Man shall not live by bread alone, right? But every word out of the mouth of God." Absolutely. And that's what you're saying. Oh yes, yes, absolutely, it is. And that's what, God, that's what Jesus is saying here. There's something more important than just having your stomach filled and being, you know, not hungry uh, for a few hours, maybe a day, who knows. Um, but then he goes on to say here, don't work for that kind of food. You don't give yourself to laboring for that kind of food, but rather for the food that will lead to eternal life. Now that, of course, is a spiritual food, one that um, many people would never have and, and wouldn't understand, and they missed it. Uh, and notice that he says here also that the Son of Man will give you this everlasting life, this eternal food, if you will, because the Father has set his seal of approval on him. And a seal of approval, even today, but in biblical times as well, meant that there was an authority that gave it hit the, um, the, the uh, ability for this person to do what they did and a seal was placed upon them that said under my authority I'm telling you this is a real thing. We have the same thing today. We, we seal documents today. We have notary publics and what they're doing is assuring somebody else that this is a, this is a real thing. This is a real person who stood before me. I saw um, that, you know some kind of identification. I put my stamp on there, I sign this thing, it's a seal of approval. We have seals of approval all over the place, in our food, uh, in clothing, in, in all sorts of medicines, all sorts of things. And this seal of approval, though, was one for eternal life, given to Jesus and sealed by the Father. Uh, we don't want to miss that sealing, I think, if we can. Any thoughts on that part, Doug? Only that, you know, Paul tells us, you know, the food for stomach, the stomach for food. You know, if we live for, you know, temporary things, we're going to find ourselves in the world of hurt because uh, these things are not going to last. Paul says in Second Corinthians in chapter 4 that the things that are temporary are seen, the things that are unseen are eternal. Uh, 
we've got to get that into our, our minds and into our thought process because what do we store up? We, you know, we get bigger homes, we get, you know, bigger TVs, we, you know, the newest electronic gadget and, and all the rest. And there's nothing wrong in and of themselves. It's just that we put them before God. Uh, they become idols to us. And so uh, even eating can become an idol if we're not careful. Yes, well, anything in life can become an idol. Uh, and we, I've often said we don't necessarily have to give up our hobbies, our, our interests. Those are things which enrich our life. In some cases, those are things that help us to become better witnesses. So we don't need to give up those things that have, we have an interest in, um, but we can't put those before God. Those, those come secondary. Um, Jesus went on to say here that, uh, truly, I says, I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. The bread from heaven came from God. That manna that they, they knew about and that they collected every morning didn't come from Moses. It came from God. I think that's what he's trying to show me. You missed the signs. Yes, exactly. I, I gave yeah. you bread, and you want more bread. Yeah. You don't want me. Right. You want the bread, and Moses gave you bread. But that's not the point. The point was Moses was being an emissary from God yes. in order to provide for you so that you would worship the true God. And I said a moment ago, as a prototype, that manna was, if you will, a way of, of envisioning what Christ was going to be as the true bread of life. Mm -hmm. but, but Moses didn't bring See, they gave credit, I think, in some cases, to Moses for the, for the manna, without giving credit to God who provided the manna. Same way here, oh, a prophet gives us food. No, this is the Messiah, the very Son of God, that is giving you the food under the seal of the Father. What? Amen. My thought was, did you miss the point? It's God giving them the Messiah, not the prophet giving them food. Right. So they're missing the transfer from God to them. Right. As they and, and you and that they're just missing that transfer totally. Right. Exactly. Now you think? Also, <coughs> yeah. Please. They got yeah. tired of the manna after yeah. yeah. a while. Yeah. yeah. And I think in his his teaching here, he's showing them, "I'll give you the bread." that you'll never tire of. That's a good right. right. Yeah, it is. Verse 33 says it right there. Yes, it, that's exactly right. That's exactly where I was headed. For, for the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. That's Jesus. That's a, that's a claim that Jesus is making of himself. And notice they said, Sir, give us this bread always. We want to have that always. The real bread? Uh, that barley loaf? Yeah. But they, I think we're missing the point. That this life that Jesus was giving them was a spiritual life as well. It was an eternal life. And in some cases, I think they, they missed it on, on, that, on that account. But I'm just going to say... Oh, wait a minute, uh, Randy, do, do you think that we do at times, in, uh, as I'm listening, boy, these studies are great. Thanks, guys, in Jesus' name. Okay. <laughs> you know, we're born into the side of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Yep. We are motivated, born into it. We can't help it. If we're not saved, if we're lost in it, well, it's what we get, that meal, the world's meal. And we're not just talking food in the belly, we're talking about the, the meal that we get out of the world and participating in it. Yep. Gee, the only way that we can get from that born into the sin of it is to accept Christ first, of course, through salvation, and then start feeding on the other meal, which is spiritual. Well, this is where we fail, and Barry's in the middle of this failure at times. Man, if we're not studying God's Word every day, guys, if we're not having quality prayer every day, you know, not trying to get it in, oh, I'm so busy with the world's affairs, i got to get my prayer time in. No, no, I'm talking about a different moment of prayer. When your feet hit the floor, whenever that is, and you can't wait for it. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, show me to, to realize what I should be having a meal with. And then repentance and forgiveness. Oh, man. We're also victims still, realizing real the, where the real meal is. Doug, thought? Yeah, in verse 34, notice they said, Sir, give us this bread always. As soon as I read that, I thought of the woman at the well. 
noticed she was going to draw water and she was doing it in the heat of the day so the other woman wouldn't make fun of her. And Jesus said, I can give you water and you'll never thirst again. Well, in her flesh, she says, Lord, give me this water. Well, here these people are and, and they were hungry and Jesus fed them the day before and yeah. he says, I can give you bread that'll never run out. Mm -hmm. And they says, well, sir, give us this bread always. You know, it, it's missing the point once again. It's, mm -hmm. it's people wanting their fleshly desires. You know, the woman at the well wanting water and they, these people wanting bread. But not getting to the point, but the woman at the well did. You know, Jesus kept talking to her and she finally did understand he was talking about her spiritual need. Yes. And, uh, did come to believe in him. But we, we have no indication that these people ever came to that same knowledge because uh, he goes on to reveal himself to them and says to them, you know, uh, you come to me, you'll never be hungry. Anyone who comes to uh, believes in me will never be thirsty again. Now notice these people, they clamor for this. And Jesus knowing they're not coming for the right reasons, what we've got later on in this very chapter is that Jesus said to him, well, you're going to have to drink my blood and eat my body. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason for that is because they had rejected him as Messiah. Right. And Jesus said, if you're not going to accept me for who I am, I don't want you. Right. And so he says things as offensive to him. Now, he was talking about the Lord's Supper, you know, the symbolism right. of, of right. the wine and, and the bread, yes. and how it was going to be symbolic of it. But they're... they're thought he was talking cannibalistically, yeah, right, right. but it offended them, and they walked away, and it says all of them now, who had been following these two days, and had been fed, and were filled, uh, and then Jesus looked at the disciples and said, will you go away, mm -hmm. and they said the right thing, where may we go that we might find one who has the words of life, right. Jesus is willing to let anyone walk away who won't accept him for who <coughs> he is, right. and uh, for the claims that he makes. And you can't bargain. You no. can't bargain with them. Uh, no, and Duck points out something here. Uh, he says, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. Note that word. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. The hunger and the thirst match up directly to the ordinance of, of the Lord's Supper in the bread and the wine. One is a bread for the hunger. The other is for thirst. And so, the you know, Jesus is even in this particular verse is giving us an indication of the ordinance that is to come. Uh, notice too, I think there's another sign here in a way that Jesus multiplied the, the barley loaves and the fish. But in a similar fashion, one of the signs I think of this miracle is that he is also very capable of taking even a few people and multiplying those who believe in him through our witness. We're, to the people we meet on a regular basis and where we have an opportunity to, to discuss Jesus and what he many, means to our lives, we are also, in a way, the, the, the barley loaves and the fish. And Jesus multiplies what we do in a way that, in some ways, is just enormous. It, it, I think of a, one person, a Billy Graham, and how many people that man was able to reach. Now, he had a ministry, he had other people helping him, but one person, and how many people did he reach? And I think that's, in some way, we are similar to the barley rolls and the fish in terms of being multiple. That brings me back to what you said earlier, where Jesus didn't wasn't demonstrative about what he did. And we as Christians don't need to be be boisterous or outlandish, but we at the same time, we shouldn't hide who we are. Good. There we're has not, to be a balance. Stop it here. We're out of time. So uh, we'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father God, we are thankful that we're able to come before you today. We thank you for those who are able to come and join us by phone. Father, uh, sorry things didn't get off to a good start. And I pray that next week we'll have things ironed out where people can join earlier and uh, be able to uh, take part in this. Now, Father, help us to learn the lesson that uh, is given here today that we put Jesus first and his righteousness uh, and all these other things that be added to us, then we understand, Father, that he is truly the one who came to take away the sins of the world. That is his greatest ministry. That is the reason he came to obey the Father. 
and Father, it's only through Jesus' sacrifice we know that we have salvation in the Son. So, dear God, watch over us, protect us, and bless us, and bring us back next week. For we all ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. Brothers, sisters, God bless you. You know, Billy Graham, I hold it.